so the first step in making a good control unit should always be the sequencer here or uh, in this case uh, the, I'm sure there are control units without sequencers but uh, in this case uh, this design requires one uh, so the way I'm focusing only on the sequencer for right now what this part does is it takes the clock signal and the enable signal and if uh, the circuit is enabled well there I'm just turning on uh, the clock for uh, right now if it's enabled I uh, see it steps through uh, four possible states using these two T flip flops and the way that works is uh, uh, every time the clock goes high it enables this first flip flop uh, and since the flip flop only changes its state on the rising edge uh, there's uh, the two possible states that can be in and then if you run the output of that into another T flip flop uh, that actually has a doubling effect so that there's four possible states that this whole thing can be in and that uh, runs out to this decoder here which is only enabled when the clock is off uh, for uh, timing purposes if it's only enabled when the clock is on you'll have bad race conditions uh, that will really ruin your control unit uh, also this reset uh, pin here now uh, that's used to reset all of the state in the entire control unit uh, I just had it running uh, from here in order to get it close to these T flip flops for demonstration of course and turning off the enable we can demonstrate the reset, uh, that functions correctly. I also have this debug button here that steps through the state. And, and so, uh, that's pretty basic. Uh, you need to run uh, the input into the clock and the, uh, the T input at the same time in order to get it to work the way you want it to especially in this case uh, and then running out from the decoder we have the main bus now on this bus there are eight wires some of them are bundled wires like these two 8-bit wires and this one 4-bit wire uh, but most of them are either sequencing wires which are these four or this reset wire uh, there's also where no, there's no other single bit wires in this entire bus. Uh, and so this bus is meant to be uh, where all of the important values of the, the control unit go to to get to them easily, uh, which eliminates a lot of really bad busing and just generally helps visualize things. Uh, so out from here, we should go up to here and we see the program read input area. Uh, this is pretty simple. You have the uh, the instruction in the uh, bus here that goes from the uh, I think the main bus of the entire processor, or just directly from uh, where the memory is being read from, uh, and that goes into these two registers here for address and opcode. I'll explain uh, what that means later, uh, but. Uh, in the first step of the sequence, I'll show now, uh, this is activated to store you know, the input into that register, and on the second uh, step of the sequence, uh, the address is activated, and then the third step is actually null. Uh, the only reason that's there is as an artifact from uh, the output of this decoder always being a, uh, a power of two. Now, of course that can be rectified, but that would require a lot more complication that's totally unnecessary. But on the fourth step of the sequence, uh, now what it does now is it activates all of the execution, and so it passes the address and opcode to these outputs here, and via these control areas here, and it also optionally activates this uh, area here which I'll talk about later. So the opcode is the first thing that's read and the address is the second thing that's read. Now the opcode is the operation you're uh, trying to perform in the program 
in program memory, which in this case is also part of general memory in order to make things uh, work better. Uh, so the opcode has two parts, uh, I'll explain over here. Now uh, the first four bits, uh, which are the least significant bits, are selecting the module the control unit wants to talk to in the processor. Uh, for instance, the ALU, uh, the the memory, or maybe a stack, or the IO bus, uh, the IO buffers. Uh, maybe you want to have another ALU, a second ALU to do operations while the first one is busy. Uh, or maybe you want to uh, have this run out to a, a separate processor so the processors can talk to each other more easily. Uh, really, whatever you want. And the uh, other four bits, the more significant bits in this uh, binary number, uh, are the command you want to send through that channel. And so, on the other end, the module you're wanting to talk to will have uh, one of these I'll talk about later in it, which will read the first four bits, and if the, those four bits are equal to uh, the address that is inscribed into the module uh, by default, like a ROM, uh, then it will listen to the uh, next four bits by allowing them through, otherwise it will ignore this. And so you actually need uh, a receiver for this signal in order to make it make sense to anything in this setup, which actually decentralizes a lot of the control uh, of the processor so that you know, the control unit doesn't get crazily bloated. Uh, what else? Uh, address out is self-explanatory, that's just addressing a part of memory. And the reason this uh, multiplexer is here is uh, so that you can have uh, the, I think, uh, uh, the address here, this is a reference address, uh, the second one read, and so after the operation you want to perform, uh, there's an address in memory that's passed into the control unit uh, from the program, which is referring to uh, a, an address in memory where a number is stored, and so this can uh, tell the ALU uh, these first uh, four bits, uh, to add with these second four bits uh, to uh, or from an address in memory to its uh, accumulator, its internal memory. Uh, and so that would be the first step of a program, or any step really. Uh, and so that's these three uh, modules covered, I think, uh, mostly. I might go into further detail in a second after I'm done with these two. So the next one here, uh, stepping up in the order of abstract and esoteric, this is the self-commands decoder. It's just a command decoder that you would have in any separate module, only it's in the control unit so that it can control its own functions. As you can see, it only has three functions internally. I'll talk about those later. But here it picks out uh, from the same uh, part that it has this, and so it takes in the opcode, and then it breaks it in half, uh, just like normal, like I said, uh, with the first four bits being checked for parity for uh, the address of the unit. Uh, the address of the control unit should always be zero. The address of the first accumulator should probably always be one, uh, just to keep track of things and have uh, standards for, uh, yeah, you know, inferring things. Uh, these bars here are just visualizers for debugging. They don't have any purpose beyond that. And so the second four bits are uh, sent to this demultiplexer, uh, which is activated if uh, the parity is correct, uh, and that will pass through the, the four bit uh, command. Uh, and uh, the zero pin should always be null, just so that you can have a null command by default. So. Oh yeah, and uh, this, because it, uh, excuse me, uh, the zero pin, the reason that should always be the null command is because if you're running through a part in memory that's all zeros, you don't want to be accidentally interpreting that as commands and executing weird things that were ne never meant to be executed. And so if the control unit encounters a part of memory that's uh, completely empty, 
they all interpret it as completely empty and ignore all of it, uh, which is really good. It's a good standard to have on your control units. And so, as you can see here, the, the three commands after the null command, uh, which is actually not even a command, it's the absence of a command, is uh, the unconditional jump to command, which unconditionally jumps the program counter to uh, a part in memory between, I think, 1 and 256 in this case. Now uh, the second one is jump if the accumulator flag is zero, uh, and the next one after that is jump if the accumulator flag is negative. Now uh, the reason I didn't let, uh, yeah, the reason I didn't put in any more options than that is because this is only for demonstration, really, and uh, to fully form this out is pretty unnecessary, and in fact, the only one of these you really need in order to have it complete is zero, uh, but negative is very useful, uh, carry is the next one down in usefulness, and etc. Uh, so the fourth one can be whatever you want, basically. And so, those get uh, run over to here, uh, this line, uh, this eighth line is the, the flags from the accumulator, and that gets split up into all of its individual bits. Uh, the zero bit uh, goes to here, and the negative bit goes to here, and uh, the unconditional one just runs straight in. And this is, finally getting to the last part, uh, the, uh, the program counter and uh, the adjoining instructions for it. Uh, this uh, piece over here is the jump instruction handler, and this here is the uh, the iterator that goes through. So, actually checking that now. Yes. You can see on the first two pulses of each uh, of each run, uh, it steps because it just read one of the opcodes or addresses and it no longer needs to see that part of the memory and so it goes to the next part. And so in memory it has opcode and then address and then opcode and address repeating. Uh, and that's the standard for this sort of program. Uh, and then somewhere off in a remote location in memory will be variable memory where the variables are stored outside of the program. And before you know, the, the variables, there should definitely be a, an unconditional jump back to the beginning of the program so that you're not accidentally reading the variables and interpreting them as opcodes and addresses. <laughs> yeah, that would be pretty bad. But uh, an advantage of this is that you can actually treat uh, it in reverse, where the opcodes and addresses can be read as variables, and more than that, you can change... A program can change its own programming by just writing uh, its own instructions anywhere in the program that it wants. And so you can have a program that can unfold. Uh, it's kind of difficult to explain, but uh, it allows for greater flexibility of the processor. And uh, the way this works is, of course, these are the if zero and if negative checks that these need to pass through, and then this combines all of them. And then this goes to the program counter here in the load pin and the uh, clock pin, and these need to both be activated at the same time to set uh, this new value, the jump to value, uh, in the D section uh, to the actual internal memory, which will be output by this Q here. And actually, to demonstrate this, I'm going to uh, give it the unconditional jump command and run it for one cycle. There. And you can see it immediately activates and pushes this into the counter. And this is the number 10. Uh, no, wait, no, not, not 10. That's 16. I, I'm, I forgot I'm reading this in hexadecimal and this in binary. And none of this is in decimal. Uh, the decimal number system. Disgusting. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, and also I have... 
uh, a debug button here as well for immediately pushing something in. So, say we were to run it for two cycles here just to get it there, and then I can immediately push it in. Oh, I just remembered it's because here you can't push anything in if uh, the iterate is active, and that's why I have this so weird. Is because you need the clock to be enabled either if you're doing a jump to command or iterating and so that's why this is here uh, and this only needs to activate if you're iterating and this only needs to activate if you're jumping uh, it's not as difficult as it looks uh, but here you can see I can just immediately jump to if I wanted to in debug mode uh, what else now uh, that's the broad strokes I think uh, oh yeah, I should probably demonstrate the jump if zero. So you can see it's trying to jump, but it's not zero. If I had this set to zero, then it would jump like that. You can see. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think. Oh yes, the reason this uh, I forget what it's called. Give me a second. It's uh the pull resistor module. The reason that's there and set to zero is because if there's not a pull resistor after this uh, <laughs> what is it called again? Controlled buffer uh, then uh, it will send out error messages whenever this is not enabled which is not what you want. You want it to send out zeros and so that's why that's there. Now uh, the multiplexer is here to alternate between the program counter for reading these instructions and actually pushing the address out to memory in order to operate on it, like when you're writing or reading. I mean, yeah, writing or reading. Uh, I might actually be missing a few things in this control unit, but if I am, they're pretty minor. Uh, and. Uh, I'm, I put a lot of time into this, so I'm pretty sure I'm not missing too much. I always forget something though, of course. Uh, hmm. Trying to think of what else there is to talk about in this. I think I talked about everything. Uh, well, uh, maybe I'll just do an update video if uh, <laughs> I get caught missing something. <laughs>